<laughs> All right, chapter seven, counting for receivables. Everyone seeing the board? Wow. All right, so we just ended chapter six. We're talking about why it was important to actually receive our money and how to speed up accounts receivables. So let's pick right back up and start there. A receivable is an amount due from another party. You see a graph showing the recent dollar amounts of receivables and the percent of total assets for four well-known companies. If you look on the board, you're gonna see Abercrombie and Finch, Pfizer, Callaway Golf, and John Deere. But what's this telling us? The amount of receivables and their percent of total assets. So look at Deere. 57% accounts receivable represents 57% of their total assets. Whereas Abercrombie, 2.9%. Now one thing, when you look at the dollar amount of receivables, it would be nice to know what's that base off of, so it'd be nice to know sales or at least the dollar amount. So I want to direct you more to the percentages. What do you notice as we transition from Abercrombie to Pfizer to Callaway into Deer? It increases. It increases, but what about the company type? We start out with a merchandise company having a smaller 2.9%, then we move into a pharmaceutical, and then you're going to start to go into resellers of more physical items. I also want to point out that as we go from, let's look at these individuals, look at the ticket items. Who do you think issues the largest ticket <coughs> items? Down there. So a company must also maintain a separate account for each customer that it's tracking and how much that company purchased has already paid and still owes. So for every company, every company, the company must track for every customer. They're gonna have an account where it's tracking how much that customer has paid and still owes. So let's look at an example of a sale on credit. Okay, on July 1st, Techcom has a credit sale of $950 to Comp Store and a collection of $720 from RDA Electronics from a prior credit sale. What can we observe? What are we doing? Separating cash and credit. We are separating cash and credit. <laughs> so we see on July 1st, we have accounts receivable for comp store. Now here, remember, you're gonna keep it separate for each person you're doing business with. So we see one for comp store and we see one for RDA Electronics. What is accounts receivable? It's an asset. So we have issued a credit sale of $950. We've not been paid on that, but we are expecting to be paid in a timely basis. So we would debit accounts receivable. So we are going to increase accounts receivable. And where are we getting this accounts receivable from? From the sale. So we would credit sale. Now, on July 1st, we have RDA. What are they doing? 
Okay, they paid, we collected $720. Okay, so RDA was a prior accounts receivable and now we have collected on it. So notice we are debiting cash because we now received that cash and we're gonna increase it and we're gonna take it from accounts receivable. So that's why you see us crediting accounts receivable, we are decreasing. Good? All right. This is gonna show us the general ledger and an accounts receivable ledger. Advantages of allowing customers to use credit cards. Why might someone want to allow you to use credit cards? So here, think of Visas, MasterCards, American Express, Discover Cards. Also think of debit cards sometimes referred to as ATMs. So why would someone want to allow us to use credit card sales? Allows us to purchase stuff without cash? Allows us to purchase items without cash. The customer does not have to open an account with each store. So these, you know, these cards are recognizable in different stores. Might be another reason you would use one. What else can you do? Like a single payment, monthly payment instead of several. You can payments. finance it. Rather than the outlay of all of the cash at once, the issuer of this card most likely will allow you to make monthly payments on this item. Now by you making monthly payments to the credit card company, <clears throat> cash collections are quicker to the retailer. So they have received their money. Again, it could be an item that you might not have, you know, you couldn't, you didn't have the cash on hand, so you, the sale would have never taken place without the use of the credit card. Now, things to consider, customer's credit is evaluated by each issuer. And we just said sales increase. The risk of extending credit or transfer to the credit card issuer. When the credit card company makes that payment for you, the agreement then is between you as the big spender and the credit card company. So the risk of you not paying, the default risk falls with the credit card company. Now on a credit card sale. So on July 15th, Techcom has $100 of credit card sales with a 4% fee. And $96 is received immediately on deposit. That's not uncommon for this 4%, the credit card company is not going to work for free. They're gonna issue and have a credit card expense that they're gonna levy against the retailer per transaction. per transaction. So here on July 15th, a hundred dollar credit card sales was rang up with a 4% fee. So we see where the, we are going to record cash on hand of $96. So that's 96, that's taking in less that 4% fee. We're also going to put a separate account below called credit card expense. And that is where we will record the $4. And finally, we are going to pair the combined cash and credit card expense with sales, and we credit sales for $100. Now, let's assume 
TechCom must remit electronically the credit card sales receipts to the credit card company and await for the $96. So now what's going to happen? So you're going to record the transaction on the 15th, and then you're going to record where you actually receive the payment on the 20th. Good observation. We still have the original receipt, and down here we're going to receive where we actually, we're going to account for where we actually receive the cash. So again, we're going to receive $96 from this accounts receivable up here. We debit cash, so what are we doing? We debit an asset. We are increasing. And then we are going to credit accounts receivable. And accounts receivable being an asset here. When we credit it, we are going to reduce it. All right, let's look at installments. Amounts owed by customers from credit sales for which payment is required in periodic amounts over an extended time period. The customer is usually charged interest. So now think back, we're gonna look at an example of Ford Motor, but this might explain, give us more insight into that graph we looked at earlier with John Deere and its larger ticket items. All right, Ford Motor Company reports more than $70 billion in installment receivables. So in this example, you're going to want to account for the accounts receivable each time that payment is issued. Remember, you would have to account for the amount, the cash amount that was received, as well as you'd have a separate item for interest. There's actually charging interest. You would want to be sure you were accounting for the interest. I thought there was an example. As always, assuming you were going to look at the need to knows that are available in these slides. All right, let's look at value and accounts receivables and the direct write-off method. That might come as a surprise to you that some people do not pay their bills. <laughs> Now, some customers may not be able to pay their account. In accounting, we refer uncollectible amounts, we refer to these as bad debts. So what are we going to do when we realize that we're not going to be paid? Collections. Collections. Well, first we have to do some accounting to get rid of these. Two methods that we can use the direct write-off method, and the allowance method. All right, so let's look at the first. Direct write-off method. Okay, now TechCom is going to determine that. On January 23rd, they're going to determine they cannot collect $520 that is owed by Jay Kent. 
And one thing to notice, the specific customer is noted in the transaction. Remember, we're gonna have a separate account for each customer that's gonna reflect how much they, the dollar that they've purchased, how much they've paid, and how much they still owe. So note here, we are going to use the specific customer in notation. Now, on January 23rd, bad debts expense, $520. Did we increase it or decrease it? Decrease. Good job, we're increasing it. So we know we're not gonna collect it, so we're increasing. To increase an expense, we would debit. Now, this is money that we were previously expecting to collect. So this money was sitting down in our accounts receivable account, but now we realize we are not, so we must remove it. And to remove it, we are going to credit the accounts receivable account associated with Jay Kent. Specifically, that way we can keep his individual record up to date. And now let's assume that we're going to recover. So we've written it off. And now Jay Ken on March 11th is able to make a full payment. This always reminds me of an example. I actually had a lady and I tip my hat to her while I won't name her by name, was in need of our services one time. And this was goes back to like three years ago and engaged us in service. We provided it. I discounted it as much as I could in order to still be fair. And we did something for her and it took she went through a lot of bad luck after that and noticed she was late on her payments. And I called her one day and I said, hey, we're just gonna write this off. And she said, no, I'll pay all my debts. And this old lady sent me a check for $10 every month for three years. And every year I wanna call her and say, I wanna write off the balance of that. Please, Mr. Neal, don't write it off. I owe you that money. And she paid it every, and she was never late on that payment. And I always think of that, that lady. Still stay in contact with that lady. She's engaged in a whole lot of other services since then because the life turned all the way around. She's moved off to Florida. She's living the sunny life right now. Got back on track. But I always think of that example there. I try to write that off every year. She never would let me write it off. So, here, Jay Kent, we wrote him off. <laughs> and now he's ready to make full payment. He's gonna wreck it, he's gonna make good. All right, so what are we doing here? On March 11th, now remember in the prior example, we credited his account. So we're gonna have to bring that back out, and now we are debiting the accounts receivable account for Jay Kent. $520. We're reversing the prior transaction that we just saw. We are debiting accounts receivable and we are going to credit the bad debts expense to reinstate an account previously written off. And you will notice a little written explanation right here letting us know what we're doing, giving more information. What must we also do? Record it. Record the cash that we took in. So on the same date, you see a record of cash being debited or increased for $520. And we're gonna show where accounts receivable is credited or reduced by $520. To 
this notebook keeps jumping on his slide. I don't have fast fingers, but. All right, let's look at this. The matching versus materiality. What's the matching principle required? Expenses to be reported in the same accounting period as the sales they help to produce. Matching principle says we report expenses in the same accounting period as sales they help to produce. Now, what's the materiality? An amount that can be ignored if its effects on the financial statement is unimportant to users' business decisions. Yes, states that we can ignore it if its effect on the financial statement is unimportant or we'll say insignificant for business decisions. Okay, the allowance method. Now, at the end of each period, we're going to estimate total, total bad debts expected to be realized from that period sales. All right, so you're going to have to estimate the amount of bad debts expected. Now, this method has two advantages to the allowance method. One, it records estimated bad debts expense in the period relating to when sales are recorded. And two, it's going to report accounts receivable on the balance sheet at the estimated amount of cash to be collected. Rather than the full amount, we are estimating the amount that we actually expect to collect. All right, so let's look here to Techcom again. Techcom has credit sales of $300,000 during its first year of operations. At the end of the first year, $20,000 of credit sales remain uncollected. And based on history, Techcom estimates that $1,500 of its accounts receivable would be collected. So they're going back on prior experience and saying of the $300,000, we expect $1,500 to not be collected. So at the end of the year, bad debts expense is going to be debited $1,500. And note we're going to have an account allowance for doubtful accounts. And again, our written explanation to record estimated bad debts. Now on the balance sheet, and you'll see this reported, current assets. So we're going to look at accounts receivables, $20,000. And you see where on the balance sheet, we are subtracting out our allowance for doubtful accounts. And we are reporting the net difference for $18,500. Okay, now without this method, we would have been reporting the accounts receivable at 20,000. We would be waiting on, we'd actually be waiting on the non-collection. But here we're being, think of it as being a little more proactive and estimating. Now, Techcom has determined that Jay Kent's $520 is uncollectible. Thank you. 
<laughs> All right, so TechCom has determined that Jake Kent's $520 account is uncollectible. So on January 23rd, we debit allowance for doubtful accounts, 520. And just note here on the accounts receivable, remember we're using the specific accounts receivable for this customer. Now recovery of bad debt. Think of my example that I just gave. To help restore credit standing, a customer sometimes volunteers to pay all or part of the amount on an account even after it has been written on. Bless you. So here you go, you've already written it off. But the customer comes in and in an effort to keep credit in good standing, they want to pay off their debt. So on March 11th, Kent pays his full $520 account of previously written off. Notice you're seeing this looks very similar to what we just looked at in the prior example. So the big change between these two methods is one, under the direct method, we're waiting to it to be realized before we record. Under the allowance, we're estimating the amount we are expecting. Okay, once that money, if that money is ever recovered under each example, you're going to have to adjust accounts receivable and the allowance of doubtful accounts. You're going to reconcile those two accounts and then you're going to have to record the actual cash that was received. All right, so let's look at estimating bad debts. I can see when I said estimated there, I saw the clock, the little wheel, hamster wheel is turning and some of you were thinking, how do you estimate? All right, first method we can use, the percent of sales method or accounts receivable methods. Using percent of accounts receivable or the aging of accounts receivable. All right, percent of sales method. We can simply say bad debts can be computed by taking the current period sales estimated or multiplied by the bad debt percentage. That sounds like the easy way. It's a direct multiplier now, obviously, you're going to want to have to have some basis for determining that bad debt percentage. You know, it's not just a random number that you would pull out. But you would want to be able to make sure you had a sound basis for estimating. Or you just like QuickBooks do it? <laughs> no. That joke. Okay. <laughs> well, here's the use of technology. Remember, you QuickBooks would compute that for you, but you're going to have to go in and input that multiplier. Or at least you're going to want to be, even if you had sophisticated software that could analyze and suggest, you might want to go in and actually manipulate that number to better fit your accounting records. All right, so Music Land has sales credits of 400,000 in 2015. It is estimated that 0.6% of credit sales will eventually prove uncollectible. Quick multiplication, 400,000 were their sales and 0.6 was the estimated amount, so they are going to use $2,400 for bad debts expense. Now notice here that we're using credit sales. 
There's going to be no collection issues to determine if this question comes up later. The reason if we're specifying credit sales, because if somebody walks into your establishment and actually hands over physical currencies, there's going to be no collection issues to reconcile here. All right, the accounts receivable method. Compute the estimated amount of the allowance for doubtful accounts. Okay, so the year end accounts receivable multiplied by the bad debt percentage. And the bad debts expense is estimated by taking total estimated bad debts expense and subtracting previous balance and allowance account. Now again, what are some basis that we might get this bad debt percentage? What are some factors to consider? <clears throat> Economic trends. Economic trends. Okay, go back and let's look at, first I would say direct it toward your past history. If there's anything you can look at under your past history. But economic trends. Now let's go back to the 2008 financial crisis. We could say it was a tough economic time here in the country for many spenders. And the amount of uncollectibles might have increased during that period. You might have considered high unemployment numbers. You know, if you're selling to the public and unemployment numbers are rising, that means more and more individuals are without work. And without work, I assume they have a more difficult time paying the bills. Anything else? I didn't hear you. Still can't hear you. The location. The location. Location. Yes, definitely. I mean, when we think about economics, you know, I shouldn't say it should be based off of a national trend. Sales demographics, you know, who's your customer base? You know, that would probably relate more over to your prior history of bad debts. But if you were a new established company, you might more specifically look at geographical location and take into account your customer base. All right, so under this percent of receivables method, Musicland has $50,000 in accounts receivable and a $200 balance in allowance for doubtful accounts at year end 2015. Past experience suggests that 5% of receivables are uncollected. So here we are going to take the amount, remember we're basing this off of the amount in accounts receivable. We have 50,000 in accounts receivable multiplied by our estimated 5%. Here we get a balance of $2,500. Now, where are we taking this $2,500? We see that we've already got $200 sitting in the account. So we're not gonna bring over the full 2,500. If we're estimating for the full year, our balance to be 2,500, we need to only adjust by moving 2,300 over into that account. with me? 
All right, now aging of receivables method. Now we're gonna first classify each receivable by how long it has been past due. Then we're gonna take each age group and multiply it by its estimated bad debt percentage. And then estimated bad debts for each group are going to be totaled. So let's look at the music land schedule of accounts receivable by age dated December 31st, 2015. And notice over here we have our individual customers. And notice how they're broken down, not yet due one to 30 days, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, and then finally over 90 days past due. Now first, the not yet dues are total. Each column thereafter is total. And then we're gonna sum all of our totals. So the estimated uncollectible is $2,270. Why would you tack on 2% on any debt that's not due yet? Why would you go ahead and anticipate? History is going to show not yet due. You might find that even though you've not paid it, you assume that everything that's not been billed, there's still gonna be some uncollectibles in there. So the fact that you've not billed for it does not take away that some of those people are not gonna pay you. Now you will notice though that the percent uncollectible, we're using a smaller multiplier. Mm -hmm. And as we increase the time, our multiplier is also increasing. What that's suggesting is history would, and I would agree with that, history would show if someone hadn't paid you within 90 days, probably more likely they're not gonna pay you than someone who was one day late. But good question. So here, Music Land, we have the same unadjusted credit balance of $200 in the allowance account, and we estimate that we need $2,270 in that account. So we're gonna reconcile $2,070 with the prior $200 balance. Remember, our total account at the end is going to have to equal what it is that we're estimating. Mm -hmm. So this could be money that was left over from the prior year. Or prior, we'll just say the prior accounting period. All right, here's a slide of a summary of methods. Let's look at notes receivable. Somebody tell me what's a note receivable. I'll kick it up here. Promissory note. Raise a promise to pay. A written promise to pay a specified amount of money, usually with interest, either on demand or at a definite future date. Here's what a promissory note looks like. So the amount is written, the date is up here. The terms are specified, 90 days. You promise to pay to the order of, the payee is listed. The dollar amount is actually like you would write on a check, it is written out to match the numerical value you recorded up at the top. The interest rate is specified. And then finally, the maker of this note was down in the. So, loan. like, student loans, you sign a promise right now. Correct. 
I owe you. And hopefully you're not, I always recall when I think of I owe you's, I was an old Popeye fan. Everybody remember Wimpy? Gladly pay you on Tuesday. Gladly pay you on Tuesday. <laughs> For a hamburger today. <laughs> For a hamburger today. <laughs> Know your customer. That's rule number one. We'll save that for another. We'll save that for another lesson. But just know rule number one: know your customer. All right. The maturity date of a note is the day the note, principal, and interest (P and I) must be repaid. So here on July 10, TechCom receives a thousand dollar ninety day twelve percent promissory note as a result of a sale to Julia Brown. So let's look, 12%. <clears throat> what is that 12%? What time period is that 12% based off of? All right, so look how they're adding in first how many days and how we reach the maturity date. So that's 90 days. Correct. Everyone know the knuckle rule. Everybody make a fist. No, we're not going to hit your neighbor. Let's start on your knuckles. January, 31 days. February would fall in between. March, April, May, June, July, August, October, December. Every knuckle is gonna fall on 31 days. So there's your quick cheat rule if you're trying to figure and you don't have access to a calendar, you know that if you don't land on a nickel or on a knuckle, <laughs> it's not, hey, I am a finance person. I think nickels more than I think knuckles. All right, so if you don't land on a knuckle though, you know it doesn't have 31 days here. 30 days past September, April, June, and November, August. The only thing you have to remember is 28 days in February. Yep. Except, except for a leap year. There you go. The one thing I remember from third grade. That February has a leap year? Yep. <laughs> that, well, that little saying. Well, then it took you all the way to here to know how to tell real right. quick. Remember the knuckle rule. Who thought? All right, so here was the example. First off, days in July. This was issued on July 10, so we know there's 31 days in July. Subtract out the days that have already passed. So we're going to record 21 days from the month of July, 31 days in August, 30 days in September. And notice how we're keeping a running total over here. We know we need to only pick up eight days during the month of October. So October 8th becomes our payable date. All right, now the interest computation. Remember I asked you, what was that interest rate for? What time period? How many? Well, Remember, this 12% is usually going to be calculated on or quoted on an annual interest. So that means if that note was a full year, the interest rate would be 12%. Well, we know that we're only holding this note for 90 days. So here's your multiplier 90 divided by 360. So remember, Principal times interest. So the principal of the note was $1,000. Multiplied by the interest, 12%. Multiplied by the time period. You just calculated the future value. So there, you just got a finance lesson. Principal times rate times time. If you went back and added that to the 
principal that would give you the future value of what you were paying back. All right, now sometimes you notice, why is that on 360 instead of 365? Let me point this out. In this, example, in this example, what's being issued is what's called the banker's rule. The banker's rule is gonna predate technology. It's gonna predate QuickBooks. So when a banker came in and calculated interest, it was a lot easier to multiply by 360, ending in zero, than it was 365. Okay, so if you submit, be sure that you look at any example that you submit, and be sure if it asks you to use the banker's rule, you're gonna use 360. If it asks you to use an exact rule, you're gonna use 365. If it does not ask you, and you apply either one of those methods and it counts it wrong, notify me. All right, now, notes receivables are usually recorded in a single notes receivable account. So we're gonna keep it simple. The original notes are kept on file, including information of the maker, rate, interest, and due date. Now let's look at the recording of the receipt of a note. So using the same $1,000, 90-day, 12% promissory note from Julia Brown to Techcom. Techcom received this note at the time of a product sale. So we sold something and issued a promissory note. So we're gonna debit notes receivable, $1,000. Gonna credit sales for $1,000. And again, here's our written explanation. Sold goods in exchange for a 90 day 12% note. Now an honored note. Jay Cook has a $600, 15% 60 day note receivable due to Techcom on December 4th. So here we're looking at the P&I of a note that is due in its maturity date. So on December 4th, cash of $615 was received. So because it was received, we increase it, we're gonna debit that asset, $615. Now look down here, we're gonna show notes receivable, credited $600, and you're going to account for the interest revenue. And again, that interest rate was calculated by taking principal times time, or excuse me, times rate times time. So $600 multiplied by 15%, multiplied by the time period, or 60 over 360. Now in this example, it did not issue banker's rule or an exact rule. So let me first suggest to you that if it does not ask you to specify that you apply the banker's rule. Since this presentation is using the banker's rule and since I just inserted the exact rule, it doesn't specify first start with and use the banker's rule. Everybody got that? All right, now all of a sudden, Jay Cook's had some financial difficulty. And I'm gonna say that the note's gonna be dishonored. So he's having some financial difficulty. And look, the act of dishonoring does not relieve the maker of the obligation to repay the principal and interest due. Jump ahead here. Keep building on these disposables. 
We'll get you out of here. We've got just a, this period. We'll look at the global view, and I'll introduce one ratio. All right, disposable, disposable of receivables. Now companies can convert receivables to cash before they are due. So let's look at an example here. Companies can convert receivables. So if there's a clause in there where we can convert that receivable to cash, that means we're calling it on demand. Make sure we're looking for that. So think of that IOU being called and collected. All right, the global view. Both GAAP and the IFRS have similar asset criteria that apply to the recognition of receivables. Receivables that arise from revenue generating activities are subject to broadly similar criteria. So we're gonna look at very similar criteria in the accounting under both standards. In value and receivables, both US GAAP and the international standard require that receivables be reported net of estimated uncollectibles. Furthermore, both systems require that the expense for uncollectibles be recorded in the same period when any revenues from those receivables are reported. So they're gonna require us to report receivables net of the uncollectible amounts. And in the disposition, both GAAP and international standard apply similar rules in recording the deposition of receivables. So you're going to look at very similar viewpoints under both standards under the recognition value and the disposition of receivables. One ratio, the accounts receivable turnover. All right, this ratio provides useful information for evaluating how efficient Management has been in granting credit to produce revenue. All right, back in the prior example, we talked and said everyone wants to get paid. And we talked about how the use of capital and not being able to collect. And I said how that becomes a really watched process. Okay, here's a ratio to calculate and give us a basis for determining how efficient we are in collecting. So taking net sales and dividing it by your average accounts receivables net. So in this example, uh, we're looking at Dell and HP. You want to take the net sales for any given time period here. We're shown 2010 through 2013, but take the estimated or excuse me, take the net sales, and those are reported for us. So in 2013, the net sales for Dell were 56,940. We keep this little figure here that we're reporting in the millions. Divided by average accounts receivable net. And those are reported, and we see the turnover here. So who is more efficient? Is that net income? Is that what that means? What do you mean net income? Well, it says average accounts receivable comma net. What is that? Average accounts receivable. So for this time period of 2013, the average accounts receivable net, so that's backing out the uncollected. Oh, okay. So no, the average accounts receivable net any uncollected amounts, and that's what these balances are here. So I'd say Dell was one of those. So in 2013, Dell's accounts receivable turnover was 8.7%, or HP was 7. 
Do you want to be turning over? Because Dell has six thousand five hundred thirty dollars in accounts. Average accounts received means what's open. I'm getting confused with the terminology right now. <laughs> net sales, so that's going to be the net amount that we sold. Right. Yeah. Average accounts receivable. That's how much money we're getting in. Well, that's how much money you were expecting to get in. Net, the uncollectible amount. So this is the true amount that you were expecting to receive. So you've already backed out any estimated bad debts. So it's step on. I get a Dale. Who agrees with Dale? Who agrees with Dale? No. Now it's not the time to be quiet. Okay, so it says a low turnover suggests management should consider stricter credit terms and more aggressive collection efforts to avoid having its resources tied up in accounts receivable. So, I mean, I guess that's not like. Read that again. A low turnover suggests management should consider stricter credit terms and more aggressive collection efforts to avoid having its resources tied up in accounts receivable. So now I'll ask Dale or HP. Dale. 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 Any questions? Not now. <laughs> See how just with a little bit of encouragement, you're able to jump in there and figure that out. All right. That's going to conclude our recording.